maybe in in a couple of minutes um, they'll be able to join. Okay, um, <clears throat> I will start. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Saifa Ayala, I am the moderator or chairperson of today's webinar um, on China's role in Africa's clean energy transition, the African uh, perspective. Uh, I am a research fellow in, uh, at the Institute of Development Studies um, UK. My work focuses on renewable energy, food, nutrition, um, enterprise development and employment. I am the principal investigator of, uh, of the project on renewable energy development in Ethiopia, which explores obstacles in energy procurement from independent power suppliers. Um, welcome again to this webinar. Um, it, this webinar is a follow-up of the first uh, webinar we held on the 28th of October, which focused on China's role in Africa's um, clean energy transition, uh, the Chinese perspective. Why are we uh, doing this webinar series? Just I'll give you a brief background to that. As you know, China is the largest bilateral partner in Africa um, in developing energy infrastructure projects. Recent studies show that 30% of power generation capacity installed between 2010 and 15 uh, was backed by Chinese contractors or finance. By end of this year, over 10% of Africa's power generation capacity will be developed by Chinese companies, which means that China-Africa cooperation on energy sector will significantly shape Africa's energy development pathway. However, non-hydro um, renewable energy um, sources such as wind and solar energy projects are currently playing a relatively small role with less than 4% of 200 or more projects. So our um, webinar sessions are meant to explore the reasons behind this, looking at from the perspective of um, China, Chinese institutions and researchers, and also uh, Africa and African institutions and researchers working on Africa, to look into barriers to scaling up wind um, and solar energy activities. Um, we have four main presentations. Uh, the first one is on Chinese footprint um, in Africa renewable energy sector. This is delivered by Dr. Franklin uh, Chiwora from the Open University. Um, uh, and the second one is um, Chinese finance power generation project versus project finance uh, through uh, independent power pro uh, producers. This is by Viani uh, Mutiaba. And the third one looks at China-Africa relations in the renewable energy sector. This insight from Ethiopia, hopefully colleagues, presenters from Ethiopia will join us in, in, in a few minutes time. And the last presentation is Sino-Africa relations in renewable energy generation. Insights from China, this is by, by Dr. Ulrich and uh, Lak, Lak, Lakshami. Um, and, and finally, um, uh, Ms. Han Chen will give uh, a kind of a summary uh, after the question and uh, answer session. Each presenter, the main presenters, uh, will speak for approximately 15 minutes, followed by uh, an overall 30 minutes plenary discussion session. Um, apart from the speakers, all the participants are on mute. Uh, but I and my colleagues would like uh, to encourage you to actively participate in this webinar. Please put your questions um, in the Q&A function or the chat function. Um, then my colleague Wayne Shane uh, will collect your questions to the speakers. Martin uh, Gardner, uh, the, other the other colleague, will also um, drive the presentations. Um, that said, I will now invite our first speaker, Franklin uh, Chimura, uh, who is a lecturer in um, international development at the Open University UK, uh, where he teaches postgraduate students in global development. Uh, he researches Chinese financing and development of critical infrastructure with particular focus on renewable energy in African countries and how such infrastructure projects 
contribute to inclusive growth and structural economic transformation. Over to you, uh, Frank. Well, thanks, um, Sefi. Um, thanks everyone uh, who has managed to attend uh, this webinar. I know for colleagues in China, it's it's quite late uh, now, but um, uh, thanks for, for your for your uh, presence. So I'm going to talk about um, Chinese um, uh, enterprises involvement in Africa's uh, renewable energy sector. And um, I think uh, this this presentation comes from some of the work that I've been doing over the over the past um, uh, five years, some of which uh, come from my uh, PhD uh, work where I did explore Chinese uh, enterprises involvement in Ethiopia's uh, uh, development of wind energy infrastructure, and I was particularly focusing on Adama Adama Wind Farm, and some of this also come from our recent work that I'm, uh, we are doing with uh, with Wei Shenet ideas on um, um, uh, built and road uh, initiative in Africa, uh, particularly looking at um, uh, renewable energy um, in, in Ethiopia and South Africa as, as, as our case studies. Um, so I have got three items that I'm going to basically talk about uh, in this uh, uh, presentation. So uh, obviously the first one, I'm going to give you a, a brief background uh, in terms of trying to map out the electricity or energy access challenge in Africa, and then um, uh, bring into perspective issues to do with uh, renewable energy resources endowment in Africa. And by, by so doing, we're trying to tease out um, uh, the big question that um, why is it that regardless of Africa having so much potential in renewables, uh, very, very few projects have been developed um, in that regard. Why is this the case? Um, and by trying to make sense out of that, then we bring in China here to see what so far has China done in, in Africa's uh, renewable energy transition. And obviously the central aim of this then would be to sort of unpack what um, and how China is contributing um, to towards development of renewable energy infrastructure in Ethiopia. Um, and then obviously when, when looking at this, um, I, I have sort of three issues that I want to explore, particularly on um, Chinese contribution to Africa's um, green energy transition. And obviously I have in mind here uh, the first aspect, which is on the project financing. So, so what are Chinese enterprises uh, doing in terms of financing um, uh, energy projects in Africa? And then the second issue then will be to sort of unpack uh, the construction perspective. What is it that the Chinese enterprises are doing um, in terms of constructing energy infrastructure in Africa? And then the third issue would be to look at the technology supply. Um, here, I'm particularly um, interested in identifying some of those Chinese uh, technology manufacturers that have so far uh, been doing business in Africa. And then obviously the third, the third um, uh, issue that I'm going to talk about in this presentation is to think ahead in terms of um, what options do we have in terms of transition to, to, to green um, energy in Africa? What sort of financing should we be thinking about? Should we continue with this EPC uh, plus financing arrangement? Or if you want uh, uh, debt financing uh, with sovereign guarantee from African governments, should we continue with this uh, given the rising uh, uh, debt and issues of sustainability? So obviously, I think it is undoubtedly known that um, Africa is the continent, I think, with the largest number of people um, uh, without access to electricity. Uh, obviously, the trend has been changing. Um, if we go back, uh, I think, from as early as 2000 up to um, the current data that we have, which is for 2019, you can see there is some, uh, there is some, some progress um, in terms of um, uh, improving access, um, electricity access in Africa. However, um, if you if you check the the table that I've just um, uh, shown in front of you, you see that um, um, again, you know, electricity access uh, by location. Um, for example, if you compare those in the urban areas, 
and uh, there's in the in the in the rural areas you tend to see that obviously the urban areas have got a higher access rate uh, compared to those in the rural areas um but equally i mean another sort of a sad indicator here if you just check the trends in in sub-saharan africa um you find that there are about 580 million people without access to uh, to electricity um you know if you compare this figure with the world which is around 780 million people you i mean africa or Sahara, to be precise, has the highest number of people without um, access to electricity. But equally on another sort of note, um, uh, given the projections that um, uh, uh, population in sub-Saharan Africa is going to rise, so this is again going to be even uh, more devastating in terms of looking at those um, uh, without access to electricity. Uh, but if you compare Africa and other regions, you see that some other developing regions, in particular developing Asia, they are doing remarkably well in terms of um, uh, 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 improving access um, uh, to electricity. So lack of, act, uh, of access to electricity, I think it's well known and well documented that it negatively affects uh, economic development and social development trajectories. Um, and there has been some studies which sort of suggest that um, um, the unreliability of electricity provision in, in, Af in Sub-Saharan Africa, to be precise, um, affects uh, Sub-Saharan Africa gross uh, GDP growth by on average one to 2% uh, percent annually. So, so I believe that um, achieving universal energy access in Africa is crucial, uh, particularly as envisaged in some of uh, in, in goal number seven of the sustainable development goal, which is on about um, ensuring um, electricity access to all, which is modern and clean. Um, but it is also becoming clear that uh, renewables in particular, such as wind and solar could potentially play a role uh, towards achieving this goal. And the reason why we specifically identify wind and solar is because um, obviously over the past 20 years, uh, the technology has matured, um, the costs are dropping in terms of uh, uh, delivering this project. And I think there is now more international experience of delivering such kind of projects using different uh, deliver models. Could it be in terms of IPPs? Could it be in terms of EPCs? Um, so at least wind and solar technology have uh, matured to that extent. Um, but so, so what is the resource potential of Africa in this regard? And particularly, we are looking at wind and solar. How much potential does Africa has? There has been so many studies that have been done, I think, to try and assess um, using in particular uh, different um, uh, global uh, modeling uh, tools and data sets to see how much, uh, for example, wind does Africa um, has and how much of this can potentially be uh, used to develop um, energy. And there's an interesting recent study which was commissioned by IFC in partnership, I think, with um, with Everzoo, Vortex, and uh, Global Wind Energy Council, and uh, they they concluded that uh, Africa is highly endowed uh, with wind resource potential. Um, which can be harnessed for electricity generation and estimates um, move around uh, 180,000 terawatts hour per annum. And um, if you look at this, uh, this is, I think, more than 250 times than what Africa currently uh, require, because at the moment, I think Africa is sort of uh, generating around 700 terawatts. And um, if you compare it with 180,000 uh, uh, terawatts, which was concluded by this study, you see that there's quite a lot which Africa could benefit from the uh, from wind. Um, and again, the study also identified that some African countries uh, have got very high wind um, uh, high wind regimes, which are strong and um, within the range of about 8.5 meters per second uh, meters per second, and um, I think Algeria has been identified as, as one of the uh, highest endowed country with a potential of about uh, 7,700 uh, gigawatts. And some other countries include uh, South Africa, um, Ethiopia, Egypt, um, with having the potential of about um, uh, 1,000 uh, gigawatt each. But besides wind, we have also not seen that Africa is also richly endowed, in particular with solar energy resources. And um, um, as they say, you know, in Africa, you always have this 18 months of sunshine. Um, and so that literally translates to, you know, we have so much potential in terms of developing uh, our, our solar energy uh, capacity or generation capacity. And I think recent studies do suggest that there's about 660,000, uh, 600, 100,000 uh, terawatts per year. And um, 
again, if you compare with that 700, uh, 700 terawatts, which Africa is currently uh, 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 generating, you find that it's about 950 times. Um, so, so with such massive amount of uh, wind and solar energy potential, um, I think the transition to renewables, is, I think, is, is particularly possible. But the progress has been very slow. Um, and obviously, you will begin wondering, why is this case? How do we explain um, uh, such slow progress? Um, so when, when sort of trying to make sense of what do we know so far in terms of what has been installed in terms of the generation capacity from renewable, here I've put a renewable in quotes uh, because uh, it also includes a uh, large hydro. I know for some uh, uh, jurisdiction, this is a very, um, it, it's, it's uh, large hydros are usually not considered as renewable, but they tend to fall under the sort of clean energy uh, sort of category. But I've just put here, because in most in most of the places where I've been working, um, large hydros, um, they are asked by their governments, they are considered as, uh, as renewable. That's why I've put it in, in square records here. But if Frank, you check- uh, Frank, Frank, just be aware that um, you've got um, four or five minutes left. Okay, all right, that's fine. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so in terms of explaining the progress, uh, we, we, we have identified, I think there are three main issues that have so far affected this. And uh, this uh, includes uh, issues of financing, and then there's also issues of uh, co uh, regulation and uh, the bureaucracy. And some have also identified issues to do with uh, institutional uh, inadequacies. Um, I'm going to just rush through this and I, I can come back to some of this during the Q&A. So in terms of identifying what the Chinese have been doing in Africa, um, uh, we, we, we identified those three issues, which is project construction, uh, project financing, and uh, technology supply. Obviously, data is difficult to establish to, uh, to estimate how much the Chinese have so far contributed in terms of uh, project financing in renewables. But there are different data sets. Uh, for example, there's aid data, and there's also the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced uh, International Studies carry uh, uh, data set, which could also be uh, reliable. But what I have to tell you, it's quite difficult then to sort of decide aggregate in terms of this overall uh, project financing, which one specifically is for re, uh, renewables. Um, um, in terms of uh, project construction, we have seen over the past, uh, I think, uh, 10 years, I think the Chinese have been contracted to uh, construct about 17 gigawatts, uh, of which the majority has been uh, hydropower and uh, renewables, wind, solar, biomass have been at 7%. Um, and when it comes to technology supply, obviously uh, we have seen quite a number of Chinese companies uh, being um, sort of. So flat. Sorry. Carry uh, on. Carry on. Okay, uh, in terms of um, uh, technology supply, we have seen quite a number of Chinese companies um, uh, supplying technology in in, in Africa and. Um, I think because of sort of the uh, the links or the connection between uh, Chinese EPC contractors and some of these uh, technology suppliers or manufacturers, they tend to sort of have this sort of uh, international uh, networking where if one EPC contractor such as, for example, Sino Hydro gets a contract to uh, deliver a, a project, then usually they tend to source the, the technology from their Chinese counterparts. Uh, notable examples of this are, for example, in Ethiopia, Adama One Wind Farm and Adama to uh, these were EPC contracts uh, uh, contracted to Sino Hydro. Uh, the technology, for example, for Adama One was sourced uh, from uh, Gold Wind, and for Adama Two, it was from uh, uh, Sunny Sunny Group. And there are other several cases um, in South Africa as well, where we have seen, uh, in particular for the solar for solar equipment, where we've seen quite a number of Chinese uh, companies supplying um, uh, the, the, the the technology there. Um, then what, what do we wrap up in a minute or so, please? Yes, I'm already on my conclusion slide. Um, um, so renewable energy sources, I think they, they can play an important role in terms of addressing Africa's electricity challenge. Um, but sadly, we have seen that uh, quite uh, limited, or uh, there has been slow progress in terms of delivering this. And um, yes, there has been uh, sort of um, improvement in terms of the generation capacity, but I think um, more attention as well should be given towards the transmission and distribution for which I think the Chinese actors can play a big role here. Of course, financing and institutional inadequacies 
I think they have been identified in particular by most of the participants we do speak to as the biggest challenges affecting uh, Africa's transition to renewable energy. Then the final point is um, most of the participants that I've been speaking to in the previous five years, I think they do mention that uh, debt financing in particular with sovereign guarantee is no longer sustainable. I think this is because of the uh, rising debt uh, amongst African countries and obviously there's therefore need to think about other models of financing. Can we bring on board here issues to do with equity financing and um, I think in terms of, of equity financing, again, still there's a very big risk in particular by project uh, from as perceived by project financiers. But I want to bring here the South African Renewable Energy Independent uh, Producer Program. What lessons can, can we learn from there? And um, are Chinese stakeholders interested in adopting this new model of financing? I'll, I'll end here. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, we move on to the second um, speaker. Uh, who is Biani Mutiaba. Biani is um, uh, at the Electricity Regulator Authority of Uganda and he manages electricity tariff structure and pricing and reviews um, investment proposals to inform decision making and promotion of investment in renewable energy. Uh, he has a master's degree in finance from University of um, uh, Stalbosch Business School, Cape Town. He is a member of the um, Institute of Certified Public Ac uh, uh, Accountant of Uganda. Over to you, Viani. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Viani, and I'm going to make a presentation on uh, comparison between Chinese funded projects and the traditional project finance, and also look at the limitations uh, that China has faced in participating in wind and solar projects in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll be drawing a lot of my uh, examples from my experience in Uganda. The outline uh, is, uh, I'm going to look at the history of investment of power sector in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Then I'll look at the difference between Chinese funded projects and uh, uh, project finance. Uh, then the reasons why China has limited participation in, in wind and solar. Um, so <clears throat> if you look at the history uh, of um, power sector development in, in sub-Saharan Africa, before, 20, before 2000, there was predominant government participation of, uh, in terms of financing public infrastructure, including power. And over time, uh, that um, uh, uh, that put a strain on, on government resources, of course, amid uh, other competing priorities and other sectors. So governments in sub-Saharan Africa, starting uh, 2001, shifted uh, to encourage private sector participation in, in, uh, in, in the power sector. Uh, so as, um, as that happened, uh, of course, uh, maybe the next slide. Okay, as, as we go to the next slide, um, as, as that happened, um, the, 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 the participation of private sector, uh, private sector capital in the power sector did not really bring the results that government anticipated. Uh, whereas it provided uh, some good capital, it, it increased the cost of capital, it led to increase in power tariffs. And in many cases, uh, government had to provide direct subsidies to make sure that the tariff doesn't increase beyond affordable levels. Now, over time, um, governments in sub-Saharan Africa have, uh, without really uh, making a policy reversal, have turned to China as an alternative uh, source of cheaper foreign direct investments uh, in the power sector. So uh, over the last 10 years, China has positioned itself as a reliable investment partner and done a lot of projects uh, as previously presented in sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, the question that has always been asked that um, is whether China's investment uh, 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 is really fair. And there's been a lot of considerable controversy uh, for mainstream development finance uh, practitioners uh, uh, about Chinese investment. That, uh, and there's been a lot of uh, criticisms uh, regarding China's investment in Africa which we are going to look at. So as uh, we proceed, uh, if we look at the difference between China finance and project finance projects, 
uh, we, from our experience in Uganda, we, we've been able to have a good hybrid between Chinese, Chinese projects. We have uh, a power, power plant of 183 megawatts that has been commissioned. We have one of 600 that is going to be commissioned probably by the end of this year. And we have another 840 megawatts that is under uh, negotiation. Uh, and then we, we've had a lot of uh, IPPs that have come in on a typical project finance basis, but also we have a lot of, we have some projects that, that were done by government. So we have a good, um, our portfolio is well diversified to do this kind of comparison. So we, we, we noted that for Chinese projects, they are really done on a bilateral basis. You know, the Chinese government uh, then talks directly to the representative of the government in a sub-Saharan African country, which really doesn't happen in, in many of the typical project finance projects. Uh, and also what we, we noted with Chinese projects is that government is the borrower of the money and, and government is the one responsible for debt repayment. So the, the money for debt repayment does not directly come from the project uh, that, that is for which the money is, is being used. And, and many of these contracts require that government directly provides appropriation through the national budget to service the debt that was used to the develop, in the development of the projects. Uh, we also noted uh, compared to the other projects that are in many of the Chinese projects that governments are required to make uh, a kind of a, a downward contribution to the EPC costs, usually around 15%, uh, before the loan is is uh, is released from uh, China, and then also th that money is not recovered until the loan is is fully repaid. Um, the other uh, uh, aspect that we we discover that is very different from a typical project finance is that usually the loan repayment in the on the Chinese projects is not uh, pegged on the commercial operations of the project. Uh, it's really hard coded in the loan agreement. Uh, so the loan can, uh, governments can even start repaying loans before the project is, is, is commissioned if the project takes longer than was earlier envisaged. Now, of course, for a typical project finance, there is uh, non recourse financing in terms of the project and, and the cash flows and the assets are the sole source of, uh, of revenue to repay the, the loan, provide equity returns and, and, and pay the ONM, uh, but which is different. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, the project is, is, is uh, th there's actually recourse uh, in terms of financing. Uh, many of the African countries have been required to put up collateral or security uh, in cases of default. Uh, also, what we, we, we noted is that for typical project, for typical Chinese projects, there is no much emphasis put on, on determination of the generation tariff and the processes that follow, uh, which is uh, different from project finance, where the tariff is, the project tariff is actually very critical, uh, mainly because the, 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 the revenues from the project are not really being looked at as a sole source of the repayment of the loan. Um, uh, and also, we, uh, as earlier presented, we, we, we noted that there is a lot of, um, um, there is no clear separation between the financials, the EPC contractor, usually it's a state, uh, Chinese state-owned enterprise that comes in with the financing to do the project. So we've not seen a Chinese project funded by China, but the EPC contractor coming from a different country. Um, now, when uh, we continue, if, if you look at the operational risks that um, that we've uh, been able, if you if you look at the operational risks during the project, usually um, uh, when when you look at the risks, uh, uh, many of the risks are not different between uh, Chinese projects and typical project finance. If you look at the pro the, the risks uh, during project development. Um, they, they affect both Chinese projects and, um, and, and projects done under project finance because they really include project uh, risks of cost overrun, of, de uh, of delays, of designs. We've, we've, we've had Chinese projects that have delayed, for example, in Uganda, but also we have had projects that have delayed, um, uh, that are funded through typical project finance. Of course, we've also had projects that have had cost overrun under a typical project I finance IPP framework, but also we have projects that have had cost overrun uh, funded by Chinese. So 
I, I think the, 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 the risks uh, are really cut across in terms of uh, whether it's Chinese or, or a typical IPP. But when it comes to operational risks, usually what happens uh, for Chinese projects, like the ones we've done in, in Uganda, is that the, the Chinese company constructs the projects and then hands over the projects to government or a government uh, nominated agency to do operation and maintenance of the project. And we've seen that come out as a, a very big risk uh, that I think many countries should be looking out for. Uh, because then the the, the 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 government is then exposed to the to the operational risks that, that come with the project, especially if um, uh, the project was not well done. The, the the EPC contractor and the financial is really not here to make sure that the project. Apologies, Riani, you've got up you've got up uh, about four minutes to come to finish. Okay, I'm about to finish. Thank you. Now. Um, uh, uh, as I move fast, uh, of course, if you look at the cost of capital, uh, usually we've seen that uh, Chinese projects uh, uh, have cheaper debt, uh, mainly because of the collateral and, and the kind of uh, security that you give, uh, which means that the risk of default is higher because government is, is required to, to appropriate money through the national budget. Uh, we've also looking at these two projects, if you compare the EPC costs per megawatt, uh, excluding interest during construction, you really find that the Chinese projects are not actually expensive or are comparable to the IPP projects that we've done. Um, but in a nutshell, the, the risks are really the same. And, and I think uh, policymakers uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa need to look out uh, to the reason why Chinese projects were actually called in in the first place or Chinese investments, because it was, it was supposed to be a hybrid between uh, not going uh, um, uh, full blast uh, private, but also government not committing, but with the requirement for government to appropriate money uh, for debt service, actually it, it's, it's, it could be the same as giving a typical uh, direct subsidy. So um, as we proceed, and um, as I conclude, we also looked at uh, why, Chinese, why China is not really going into wind and, and solar. Uh, we, uh, in Uganda, um, the next slide. Um, in, in Uganda, we, we've not had a, a, a wind or a, a solar farm that has been done by Chinese, uh, yet we've had many hydropower plants uh, uh, done by Chinese, but we also have very many IPPs, uh, solar, wind, uh, and hydro. Uh, but um, uh, 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 you will notice that in a lot of countries, wind and solar technology has not been tested. Uh, that could be one of the reasons why we have slow appetite from Chinese. But also we, we note that many of the sub-Saharan Af African countries procure wind and solar either through a competitive tendering process or through a renewable energy feed-in tariff. And we, we've not seen much participation in by Chinese farm through tendering and a normal procurement, competitive procurement process. In Uganda, we ran a, a solar tender, but we didn't have uh, any Chinese projects, uh, farms that came in to bid. Uh, we also note that Chinese are really doing big, big projects. They, they don't really do typical small five, 10, three megawatt projects. So because the projects are huge, they would want to do solar at a very big scale. Many of the, 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 the grids, the electricity grids in sub-Saharan Africa are not developed to handle large intermittent renewable energy like solar. So uh, that is why when China comes, they want to do five megawatts of solar and then many of the grids cannot handle that intermittence uh, of, 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 of the technology to be able to absorb to be to be to absorb the, the energy without just causing instability in the grid. Uh, but also uh, many of the African sub-Saharan African countries are running refit procurement uh, um, uh, policies and these are mainly targeting small renewable projects mainly below 20 megawatts and that's why because China is doing very big projects they, they don't really look into small projects uh, uh, in, in, in Africa. So thank you very much. That's my presentation. Thank you so much, Viani. Um, right on time. And the next uh, presentation um, is on 
China Africa relations and renewable energy sector insight from Ethiopia. Um, this is a joint presentation by Mr. Halawi Lako, who is um, an engineer, um, uh, an energy expert uh, with years of experience who holds a master's degree in renewable energy. Uh, Halawi is uh, a managing director of the Ethio, Ethio Resource Group. Um, he is joined by his colleague, Getnet Tasfaye, uh, mm -hmm. who is also an expert um, in, in uh, renewable energy. Um, hello. Hello. He's had um, uh, a long experience like Halawi. Um, um, hello, Getnet Can is I go also ahead? a director of policy and planning uh, at um, Ethio Resource Group. Lawi, um, the floor is yours. Lawi, can you hear me? Okay, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Can, I, can, I, can I continue? Okay. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Saifa, for uh, uh, providing me this uh, opportunity to present the Ethiopian experience, particularly in relation with uh, um, Chinese um, support or investment in the renewable energy sector in Ethiopia, particularly with solar and uh, um, and wind energy. Um, I think you know much of it has been said already. Um, Dr. Chen Mura, um, you know, he he actually provided the the highlights of uh, Chinese presence um, in the renewable energy sector and in particularly in wind in Ethiopia. Um, and also uh, uh, presenters in the um, uh, following that also touched uh, something, but my part would be, you know, specific to Ethiopian cases. Um, okay. Um, now, when we see the investment um, or any support in terms of technical or financial from the Chinese government, is less in the wind and solar uh, sector compared to other sector um, development programs. Even within the uh, power sector, their presence in the in the hydro, um, you know, large hydro sector and uh, transmission line is significantly higher. But on those areas that Ethiopia invested, um, in so in particularly in wind, um, Chinese involvement is um, is quite high, relatively higher. Um, you know, as, as mentioned earlier, um, of the three or four uh, wind farms that we have, maybe something like 75% or more of them were built by, by Chinese. Um, that is, you know, all as uh, an EPC uh, type of contract, but all the um, technology and uh, the finance um, was obtained um, uh, from, from Chinese uh, finance sources. So, you know, the, the two, um, um, uh, maybe the second and the third wind farms that we developed in Ethiopia, uh, Adama 1 and 2, um, each with, uh, you know, 50 uh, and 150 uh, megawatts um, is, is developed by the Chinese. All the technology and uh, the finance is also obtained from, uh, from uh, China, uh, which is a total uh, of uh, a little over uh, 200 megawatt capacity. Um, and, um, you know, when we see the, the wind resource, um, I think we, Ethiopia realized the wind resource that it has, um, you know, uh, fairly recently. You know, we always, um, you know, think that um, it's only hydro and solar that we have in abundance. But um, once we um, actually did the um, national resource, um, wind and solar resource assessment, then there are plenty of uh, places where uh, wind can be uh, really of significant uh, uh, potential. In fact, in some of the sites like Aisha, um, the wind resource that we have there is maybe, you know, they are one of the best in the world, you know, with um, very little fluctuations, seasonal fluctuations, and, um, you know, very high wind speed, you know, above 10 meters per second, you know, the wind, wind speed. So this, is, this has been a very attractive uh, location and uh, also the presence of uh, the transmission line, which can uh, actually um, absorb much of the power that is generated. Still um, uh, more transmission line, the, the, the existing transmission line capacity cannot really absorb um, if we develop you know, 500 or more uh, megawatts from, from Aisha site only. 
So that, that the, the, the limiting factor in some of the locations is the transmission capacity. Um, the next slide would um, actually show us um, the, um, the, the Aisha area. And uh, um, this is um, you know, one of the best sites in Aisha. Um, you can see the transmission line behind it. This is under construction at the moment um, by the Chinese technology and by Chinese finance. Um, uh, so the Aisha uh, has a capacity of, by, you know, when it's completed, it will have 120 um, uh, megawatts, you know, uh, um, or, you know, literally over 80% of the financing comes from, from um, Exim Bank uh, from China. So, you know, you can, you can, you can see um, that, uh, um, you know, um, of the uh, uh, investments or developments that, that we have in wind, um, much of it is, is uh, Chinese involvement. Um, but, you know, you can also see that, uh, you know, other areas where the Chinese um, um, are involved as in the transmission line. Now, okay, when we see the transmission line, you know, it does have <clears throat> an overlap, you know, the same transmission line can be um, actually utilized for hydro or, um, you know, any, any source of uh, um, electricity generated from any source of um, um, energy. Um, so, you know, if you see uh, one of the, the largest um, dams uh, in Ethiopia that's been under construction um, also required um, a significant capacity, transmission line capacity in the Chinese um, um, investment um, really committed um, nearly 2 million, uh, to, 2 billion USD for the construction of it. So, you know, this, even though it is mainly for um, uh, transmitting the, 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 the power generated from the, the, um, the, the hydro dam, um, you know, it can also be um, uh, utilized to, to will um, any power generated along that line, you know, through other sources like wind and, and solar. Um, and um, um, the other, maybe the next slide, and um, uh, this is again on, on the main um, grid-based kind of um, transmission or investment or support that we get from, from China. But in the off-grid sector, you know, um, there is also so much happening. Um, I'm talking in relative terms, you know, compared to um, other countries' in investment or involvement in the sector. Um, now, um, you know, Ethiopia uh, plans or aims um, at reaching um, universal electrification access uh, by 2025, of which, um, you know, about 35% would be from off-grid means. So off-grid, when we say off-grid, um, it's a, a combination of um, standalone solar systems and, and mini grids as well. So the utility, um, um, you know, tendered out a couple of times, you know, the initial tender was for 12 mini grids and the second one, 25 mini grids. Um, you know, most of the companies that, that um, um, get the, the, the winning award for, um, for the bids are Chinese companies. Um, why is that so? Um, uh, Product quality, you know, some people, um, you know, um, comment that uh, uh, it is because of that, um, you know, low price. Um, yeah, that can also be true. But in reality, you know, we see that, you know, three fourths of uh, the, um, the, the investment or the participation in, uh, in the development of uh, solar or wind um, uh, um, power resources is, 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 is by the Chinese. Um, and in the, in the standalone system as well, you know, if you see it, um, that the, the um, off-grid products um, that we get, you know, solar products for home systems on the others, um, most of it is coming from, from, from China. Um, at times, um, um, you know, the, the, the other countries, particularly the Western countries, you know, they, they, I don't know, I, I sometimes I say that they shy away from African market, you know, this is, this is what I see, this is what has been observed in the mobile phone sector and uh, um, even, even in the power sector as well. Um, even sometimes when we ask for uh, price quotations, um, you know, Chinese companies respond quickly while, you know, the Western um, companies, you know, they, they lag behind a bit. So um, I also say that, um, you know, they, the Chinese are more 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 active, and uh, they also have, you know, their government support in terms of 
um, securing finance, um, providing loan in, 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 in uh, different forms to, to um, countries in, in Africa as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think this is also what I've uh, partly um, discussed. Um, the next one. Um, and and when when I see the the uh, um, the uh, uh, you know major challenges uh, that we see you know for um, you know less uh, development in uh, in the renewable, particularly in solar and wind sector, you know when we see the Ethiopian case, um, there are several things. You know, um, first um, um, you know the traditional. Um, practice is hydro based and uh, if you see our uh, uh, power uh, plan uh, power generation plan in the coming years it's hydro dominated and it will continue to be hydro dominated well first this is the the proven technology and second i think the technology itself is mature so the price variation um, is not is not really much but when it comes to solar and wind if you see all the the, the, the power plants you know the large power plants um, wind power plants are owned by the public, you know, the government. It's only a PC contract that the, the, the private uh, international um, uh, um, developers participated. Uh, one price, it, you know, um, that would be quoted, um, um, you know, the tariff uh, um, that would be quoted by, by the potential investors uh, for several reasons. First, you know, we don't have the skill um, here for um, negotiation, you know, in the power purchase agreement. And uh, also, as it has been said earlier, you know, securing sovereign guarantee is also, um, you know, we see it, um, the government see it as, as a kind of um, challenge and uh, potential threat in the future, because, um, you know, this has been observed in time that um, technologies, solar and wind, continuously their tariff um, you know, um, goes down. So um, if government um, um, secures or locks one agreement, then the next year or the coming two years, the price significantly dropped down and they feel that they would lose. So this is also another another challenge. So every time they want to wait um, um, until uh, we get the, the lost um, uh, price. Um, this has been observed, you know, in the solar uh, um, IPPs. Um, which um, tendered, which was, which were tendered out, I think a couple of times, each hundred megawatt capacity, but none of them um, are actually committed and are under construction. I, I think behind it is, you know, one of it is sovereign guarantee, and the second one is also, um, you know, the fear that they would, um, they means the government would uh, um, lock itself in an unfair competition. Um, um, allow it, try and wrap up in a minute or so. Okay. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, uh, we see that we lingered um, for some time, still deprived uh, with sufficient power. And, um, you know, the thing that doesn't actually help government to make decision or hold governments to make decision is not really calculating the cost of not having um, electricity or not having a reliable electricity. Had we actually known that, we could have actually secured, you know, to certain take a risk to uh, to secure certain um, IPP um, IPP plants. So this is this these are you know some of the things that are um, that I see as challenges for um, widespread uh, um, uh, development of solar and wind um, energy in Ethiopia. Thank you very much, um, Lawi. Um, we head on to the uh, fourth and last but not least uh, main presentation, which is um, on um, China-Africa relations in re renewable energy generation. We follow the same um, uh, pattern, and this time it's insights from uh, Kenya. But the this is again a joint presentation uh, by Dr. Amri Chansen and uh, 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 Lakshami Behemi Party. Uh, both are at the UNEP uh, uh, DTU. 
um, Al um, Alrich um, holds a PhD degree in innovation studies, and he's been undertaking research um, on the diffusion of renewable energy in Asia and Africa, including Kenya. Uh, Lakshmi is a postgraduate, uh, a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, she has done um, research in, in Kenya. She has been working in the area of sustainable energy transition, mainly in East Africa, um, and investigating low carbon um, innovative solutions. Um, over to you, uh, Alrich and uh, Lakshmi. Thank you very much, and thank you for the, for the introduction. So we will, in this presentation, be providing you with some uh, insights from our research in Kenya, uh, where we've been looking into the issue of um, uh, Sino-African relations uh, in this renewable energy sector. So to provide a little background, um, we uh, can see, as has been mentioned, that there's a growing influence of China in Africa's renewable energy sector. A lot of the previous research we find has been looking at, at hydropower uh, and less so has been looking specifically into to wind and, and solar uh, power. Uh, although these are, as uh, we have seen, rapidly emerging uh, technologies in Africa. So what we also find is that we can see that there is a tendency, at least in the literature, to, to focus uh, at what you could call the macro level or the aggregate level looking at you know, large scale uh, databases of the flow of investments and, and so forth. And there seems to be also a, a, a main uh, focus on the agency of uh, Chinese actors, their, the motives, strategies of uh, state organizations and firms. And we also find that uh, a kind of a, what we call a binary perspective where on the one side there is a you could say a dominant skepticism towards the role of China uh, in exploitation and, and so forth, uh, as was uh, mentioned previously. And on the other hand, there is a view of you know Chinese influence as you know inherently uh, seen as beneficial. So in in this project, we wanted to to take a step deep to be deeper into to this debate, and we we can see that what is may, what may be missing. Uh, is you can see on the one hand uh, more ground level research on specific uh, projects, basically more empirical research at a project level, and also research that looks at a maybe a more um, a nuanced manner in, into this uh, into this question on the role of China. Next slide, please. So what we did in this case was to look specifically at a, uh, at a big uh, solar power project in, in Kenya. It's the first of its kind, you could say, in East uh, Africa. It's a relatively big one of 50 megawatt, which was uh, put into operation uh, in December 2019. In this, uh, this project was uh, located in the Garissa County in the northeastern part of Kenya, uh, relatively close to the Somali border. And uh, this is a kind of, you could say, a very Chinese-led project, which involved the Chinese project developer, financing source, technology, and the EPC contractor. So in its own right, it's a kind of bundled project with a heavy uh, Chinese dominance. So on the Kenyan side, there were uh, a number of actors involved, the, um, the owners, not least, the Rural Electrification Agency and the Ministry of Energy. And to, to put it very shortly before we present our main findings, what we did in this uh, project was to kind of look at what we call the, the encounters or the frictional encounters between the involved Chinese and local actors. And you could say encounters is something that is going on on the ground, so to say. Um, and we look specifically at the role of the issue of employment and uh, uh, community development. And a lot of this is based on the fieldwork, interviews, focus group discussions with uh, all the actors involved. And the basic uh, framework we use to study this is the argument, as you could see shown here in the picture, that uh, we understand the uh, development impacts uh, on the right-hand side in terms of employment and community development to be a um, to be a influenced by the, the organization of the project, 
uh, which determines the what goes on within the project, so to say, the, the, which we studied by through the lens of this uh, concept of regional encounters. So over to, to uh, Lakshmi. Thanks, Ulrich. Um, so now we are zooming into these two aspects like Ulrich mentioned. So on the local employment side, we see that the project, uh, and this is, we're talking about the construction phase. Most of the employment, uh, a larger chunk of the employment is generated in the construction phase, much smaller in the operation phase. Uh, and we see that a majority of the uh, employment in the construction phase is employing local labor, uh, while most of it is concentrated on the low skilled side of work. So a lot of um, manual laborers, uh, but there's all, there was also a proportion of uh, semi-skilled workers involved. Uh, Overall, if we look at the proportion, the scale of the project, we still see that it was a highly capital intensive because there were also very tight deadlines on the project to finish it within a year's timeline. So there was a lot of emphasis on it being a very efficient project on cost and timeline. Uh, most of the uh, unskilled laborers were procured from the nearby areas, whereas the semi-skilled employees were from the towns involved mostly in electrical works and steel works. Uh, but we also see that at least during the construction phase, the workforce was uh, casual based on daily wage laborers without any formal contracts. Whereas in the operation phase, these are formal contracts. Uh, there has been some level of capacity building elements incorporated, mainly to ensure that the transition from the EPC to the ONM is relatively smooth because ONM uh, rests with the government agencies like REA, which has then subcontracted it to Kengen, which they don't have a lot of prior experience in implementing such large scale solar projects and on the ONM side. Uh, the other interesting element we also observed in the employment is the Chinese employees that were employed during the construction phase in mostly semi-skilled and highly skilled uh, as tasks were from also those that have been working on other infrastructural projects in Northern Africa and in Western Africa for several years prior to this project having taken, uh, having started. Next slide, please. So on the community engagement side, we, and I'll go through this quickly because there were a lot of specifics in the way it all unfolded, but just to touch upon a few points that from the very beginning, REA, which is the government agency had a clear intent to have a high local content. So there was a verbal ag agreement with CJIC, which is a state owned enterprise uh, to in involve local laborers. Uh, and they were also very clear on the fact that there will be some community development activities, which uh, would, be carved out of the EPC budget, but uh, Rhea was uh, the one championing it and uh, planning for the whole process while engaging with the community from early on, from the inception of the project. Uh, but we also saw over time that there was a lot of hype around the total number of local workers that would be generated as part of this project. I mean, uh, much more than the reality of uh, how much the local, uh, jobs would be created even if the like in the previous slide i mentioned 85 percent of the local uh, of the total jobs were the local jobs uh, despite that in the absolute numbers there was a large difference uh, this the land that involved for this project was a pastoral land so that it, it isn't an independent land units this was part of the community land which has a separate act so the overall ownership vests with the county and through the process there was a lot of lack of clarity on what is the i mean the issues remained a bit unresolved whether related to land transfer or how some of the compensation would be utilized uh, there was also a sense of uh, exclusion among the local community because even though Rhea was the owner on site, you would mostly have the CJIC Kenyan employees and the project management management was entirely vested with them. And uh, all of the employees that would be visible on site were Chinese and there was a sense of the local community and the committee lacking communication and losing touch with this project and the project management side of it which also led to a smaller mobilization and opposition on a temporary basis, which was then 
resolved through Rhea's intervention, and then they appointed a staff which would be on site throughout the the rest of the construction process. And there were some renegotiations on the entire community development activities and how that would be carried out and what is the budget allocation because previously there were things discussed but not a clear budget allocation done. Um, yeah, and there were some newer assurances that at least in the ONM phase, the jobs created would have formal contracts. Next slide, please. So overall, what we see is the focus on the macro side of the work has been on Chinese uh, uh, power and the, uh, that most of the local agency, which we don't get to see because they, they're kind of subsidiary. Uh, um, but what we observe in this project is that the local communities were able to convey their concerns from early on in terms of their specific demands regarding the uh, jobs and uh, industrial development at the Garissa county level. They also mobilized uh, effort and re resisted in areas which they had concerns over and the fact that the absolute numbers of the local jobs generated were quite different from the initial uh, promises that were made. Uh, representatives from the county also uh, actively negotiated the development activities like there was a school built eventually, health, uh, a, a health center, uh, local road, as well as uh, access to certain agricultural areas. So there were a lot of things that were ultimately executed before time, before the commissioning of the project. Um, yeah, and it also kind of re it gave that uh, reasserted the power of the local government, local county government in negotiation with the national government with regard to uh, some of these uh, points that I just mentioned on the community development and local jobs. Next slide, please. So when we look at overall, we zoom out, this project was implemented, we more or less see that the development outcomes were favorable in the sense that it's a completed project with minimal delays. Uh, it contributed to the sustainable energy mix of Kenya. It contributed to local infrastructure improvements, some local employment, and also reinforcement of some local leadership. Uh, it also led to a strategic involvement of uh, Kenyan engineering consultancy firm, firm uh, with some limited local transfer of capabilities. But overall, when we zoom out, we also see that the skill development component was relatively limited. And we also tie this to some of the points that were mentioned in the earlier presentation as well, that the fact that it's a bundled package in the sense that the financing, the technology, the EPC contractor, all of that is tied together. It's already negotiated as part of a bilateral negotiation, not as part of a competitive bidding process. That there is very limited scope, for instance, for Kenyan firms to become EPC contractor or a sub EPC contractor to just take to just uh, execute construction part of it, for instance, of the project. Uh, so there is still scope for more when it comes to development uh, co benefits for such projects. And uh, one of the points that also it raises is the role of the government in these kind of projects and how they can ensure more local content and plan for capacity building early on and how local employees can be involved, um, but also a targeted approach to not just local jobs, but how local stakeholders can be involved, whether it's research institutions or uh, Kenyan solar companies that are scaling up their capacities to be able to implement uh, and execute in yeah, execute construction at a larger scale as well. And in order to be able to maximize developmental benefits, even within the tight financing agreements. So uh, I'll now pass it back to Ulrich. Thank you, Lakshmi. So to try to, to provide some concluding points here. So what can we say that are the main contributions of, of this kind of micro level case study? So what we, what we find is that uh, adopting such an approach uh, helps us to provide more uh, nuances to this prevailing uh, story about China's role uh, in either, uh, you know, good versus uh, bad uh, perspective. Uh, as we saw, there were, uh, you know, uh, indeed uh, a number of um, beneficial development outcomes of this uh, particular project, but also certainly a range of challenges and um, unforeseen uh, promises and, and so forth. So 
this perspective, we argue, and this is uh, an important point to make here, that we uh, emphasize the importance of bringing forward the, the focus on the African agency, uh, which uh, to some extent has been sort of uh, seen as a kind of uh, passive receivers of uh, projects and technologies. So this is something that we, that we want to highlight here. And related to that, the deliberate need for strategic intervention also from the, from the government side, it actually to assist in, um, uh, in uh, bringing forward these development impacts. So in, in, that, in that sense, we, we see this, uh, this micro level perspective perhaps as a starting point to uh, additional uh, research going into um, opening up this black box of, of uh, Sino-African uh, relations at the project level. Uh, and we, we would uh, suggest that in, in this, as we've done in this case, this idea of, uh, of frictional encounters is an appropriate um, way of looking at this. Uh, and we, we can maybe suggest on the basis of our research that this in encountering perspective, it involves a you know, process uh, comprising a number of uh, steps over time which have certain distinctive features from the initial stage of emergence to escalation of a potential conflict to a, a final stage of uh, negotiation and compromises and so forth. And all of these encounters may involve three main actors, the project owners, project contractors, and, and local community actors. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alrich and Lakshmi. Um, you completed on time. Thank you so much. Thank you all um, the speakers for your insightful uh, contributions. Um, before I invite Ms. Han to provide her concluding remarks, um, I would like all the speakers to respond to um, questions by uh, participants. Um, the first question is to Frank. Uh, the question goes as follows. Frank, you mentioned um, there are lack of transparency and accountability of Chinese renewable projects. And um, part of your slide uh, wasn't clear to show this, but how can we work towards transparency of these projects. Frank. Yeah, uh, thanks, Safi. And uh, thanks to uh, the participant who asked that question. Um, I, I think uh, issues of transparency and accountability have been identified um, as sort of some of the challenges that in particular um, uh, African governments uh, or not necessarily from a government perspective, but maybe the public has been sort of experiencing when trying to make sense of uh, these deals involving uh, Chinese. But I should also mention that um, even though I think um, the distribution of this tend to be more from the Chinese side, I think regardless of the source or the origin of the firm, there are issues to do with transparency, even from European companies or even from American companies. On that slide, I think um, I think it was referenced to I think three or four uh, solar power projects. So when I referred to or I categorized them as unclear, it means that we don't have any information so far about what has happened next. Uh, there was just an, uh, probably a reporting that um, uh, company X has sort of entered into a, a deal with the African government to develop X amount of wind or solar, then it ends there. So from there, we don't know whether what is the phase or what stage is the project is. That's why I categorized them as, as, as unclear. But obviously, yes, issues of transparency, I think um, it's one of the big challenges that really African governments and publics in particular are really facing. And I think it does feed into issues to do with, um, you know, debt, you know, contracting local content, because rarely do you find such information out there in the public domains. Thank you very much. Um, any of the speakers who would like to come in and um, um, add to what, to what Frank said, you're most welcome. No? Okay. Um, moving on. Um, um, the next question is for Viani. 
Um, if the Chinese financing is guaranteed by African governments, what measures ensure that the infrastructure asset that is built uh, performs for many years to come after commissioning? Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I, I, I think this is one of the biggest risks, as I mentioned in my presentation, facing Chinese funded projects. Uh, but uh, what we've done for Uganda is that you need to have a very strong owner's engineer during the, the development stage that really checks the Chinese EPC contractor stage by stage. You have to monitor the project way before it, it actually reaches commercial operations. Because the risk is that these projects are meant to last 40, 50 years. I mean, this EPC contractor is going to walk away after commercial operations. Even the Chinese loan is repaid in 10 to 15 years. So you have a, an exposure of even 25 years or so after the loan is repaid. So there's a lot of due diligence that needs to be done. But a good uh, owner's engineer can really help mitigate this risk. Thank you. Wonderful. Anyone who would like to come in? OK. Um, the next question is to both uh, Viani and uh, Frank. Um, how should sub-Saharan African governments create an energy policy which include, includes wind and solar? Um, they have, um, by they, I suppose it's African countries, they have to balance the desire to use naturally abundant wind and solar with um, intermittency risk I mentioned, as well as lack of enthusiasm from China to finance small and wind solar. Is it sufficient to rely on competitive processes to fund wind and solar expansion? And how should they make ensure that um, uh, uh, ensure they have uh, adequate, adequately balanced power? Um, so either of you can go first. I mean, would you, Frank, would you like to go first? All right, yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, but to be honest, I think um, there is that um, sort of enthusiasm from most of these African governments to want to create the uh, these policy frameworks. Um, for your information, most of the African governments so far, I think they've done what we call like um, a resource assessment or resource mapping, you know, you call it wind or solar or any other form of renewables. They've so far done this assessment, they've seen the potential. But obviously, you know, um, most of these, so they're sort of logged in into, for example, it could be hydro, right, they are logged in into that. So, and the risks associated with wind and solar, in particular, the intermittent aspect, you know. So they, they are sort of taking very measured um, and sort of response in terms of necessary steps they want to do in to, to, to sort of have these policy frameworks. So it's not like an ultra thing that to, they wake up today and say that we are doing away with all our previous um, uh, energy uh, uh, generation sources into wind. So they take this like as responding to the market, but also responding to the realities in terms of what lock-ins do they have at the moment. But, and um, do they have, to, do they have the, the what, they have to, to balance the desire to use natural abundant wind and solar with intermittent uh, risk. Of course, yes, I mentioned the issues of, um, of intermittent, but then the, 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 let's see, is it, they have to balance the desire to use naturally abundant wind and solar. The desire is there, all right, um, but probably maybe the political commitment is something which is lacking. You'd be surprised that most of these African governments, they have already some sort of, some not near complete police framework, but they have some sort of arrangement like wind, for example, the master plan for wind and solar. You find countries like Ethiopia, they already have this and they're moving towards a policy framework. You go to countries like South Africa, they already have um, uh, wind, um, uh, solar uh, 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 master plan. So the desire is there. But for example, South Africa, they've been logged in in coal production, in coal generation. So that switch from coal to wind then is, you know, their political, uh, uh, economic related issues that they have to take into consideration. Okay. Um, Viani, would you like to add to what Frank said? Yeah. Thank you so much. I can add briefly that. Um, I think what many African countries are doing is that we can do a big capacity, but we spread the location 
to different places. You can do 500 megawatts, but maybe 50 megawatts across 10 sites. So then, then you're able to distribute the risk. Uh, but also what we are doing is that we are making sure that as a policy, the developer of the power plant also does the evacuation line and then the associated studies so that then there's a full appreciation of what it takes to, to evacuate this power plant. And African countries need to be able to cost the intermittent uh, renewable energy beyond the, the, the generation tariff that appears in the PPA. I mean, the, the cost it has on the infrastructure and the, the cost of really building that infrastructure because of the, the, the peculiar location of, for example, a wind farm. But that said is that um, the, 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 the truth is that research has been done, uh, especially at, at the University of Cape Town and it's been concluded that uh, bidding or tendering has results in too lower tariff than direct negotiation. So bidding uh, from empirical research has actually been able to prove that it leads into lower tariffs. So thank you. Thank you both. Um, now I would like to bring in um, Halawi. Um, um, Halawi, you spoke about uh, capacity limitations. So the question to you is how can we develop the skill to negotiate tariff agreements as Africans? Okay, thank you, Saifa. Um, I think first it's good to see, you know, when we say capacity limitation, you know, what are these capacities, you know, that we are limited to, you know, initially, um, you know, if I take you back a bit, you know, we've been discussing about uh, um, a policy framework for diversification. Um, say Ethiopia well knows that uh, depending on hydro, which we currently are, you know, nearly 95% and above, and it's um, a high risk area because of drought and climate change, it's highly impacted and um, the government well knows that, um, you know, diversification through geothermal, wind and solar is, is, is really necessary. Um, the problem is, the more that you diversify, the more skill that you need to manage your power. Even with the current um, wind that we have, you know, um, the natural trend here, I don't know anywhere else, you know, wind picks up in the evening and it's then that we need more, that, that, that it generates a lot more. And it's that time that we don't use much energy. So um, the current practice, you know, the ones that you say Adama 1 and Adama 2, you know, from around, you know, um, 11 um, in the evening, they shut, they shut them down because mm -hmm. they create instability because the uptake is small. And this is also the problem associated to development of more intermittent powers, like, you know, um, off-taking is, is possibly a problem. Um, it, it, the, the, the knowledge gap is not only on the, uh, on the power sector, but also in planning the other sectors as well. When we develop the power, plan, the, the power development plan, uh, we are anticipating um, that um, uh, power generated would be um, um, off-taken by the other sectors. But if we fail to properly manage our plan and implement, then if we just simply con uh, concentrate on developing the power uh, uh, on the power plants, then the more that you generate power, then if the industries and other sectors could not uh, offtake those power, then it would be a liability. And this is one of the fears for um, African governments, particularly Ethiopia, uh, for not really for being very careful when they invite IPPs, maybe this is one of the main reasons that they still hold back, you know, from having them in developing these resources. So, you know, this 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 capacity gap is there, and when we come to particularly to um, uh, the, the the power sector, um, the negotiation capacity in terms of setting price, you know, purchase uh, power purchase agreements. Um, you know, what makes it even worse for Ethiopia is um, the, um, the tariff is very low. Um, you know, the, the tariff that the, the utility sells to, um, to the, cons the customers. So, um, you know, they want to really put down the, the, you know, put so much pressure 
sometimes beyond the reality, particularly when it comes to geothermal base load powers. Um, and, um, and, and this, this creates really a problem in not knowing what the real generation, um, um, you, you know, how low can we get with specific types of um, resources. So this is, this is also another limitation where um, we uh, lack um, our uh, negotiation skills. Um, and, and, and also, you know, on the other hand, when we see um, about the, um, uh, you know, having, not having um, reliable power uh, and, and estimating, um, you know, what the possible loss of um, uh, uh, revenue or GDP uh, because of shortage of power. And this is, this puts the government um, in um, a weaker position, not to make decision, um, even for um, higher price um, uh, electric power development from from other sources. So, and 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 also the the tendency of sticking with traditional uh, power yeah. sources like like hydro, you know, um, instead of diversifying and managing it, you know, we develop um, excess power unnecessarily. Um, so that we stick with the traditional power sources that uh, we are used to. So these are all because of um, um, yeah. lack of capacity in, in several dimensions. So the combined effect of this yeah. really puts us in an awkward position. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Halawi. I don't know if it is your end or my end. There seems to be... Um connection problem, but um, you, you, you've done it um, very well. Thank you so much. Now, um, the next question goes to Lakshmi and uh, uh, Anrich. And the question is, what are the tensions or conflicts within the communities in, in the project area that you studied? Yeah, thanks, Sethi. Um, I mean, just to clarify one thing before I get to it, that because this did not involve, uh, because the main project land was not, okay. Typically in renewable energy projects, we see that the conflicts are around land, community engagement, labor issues. I mean, that's the classic. In case of land, the main project land was, as I said, community land. It was a pastoral uh, grazing land. It uh, rest west with the county government to have that negotiation with the national government because it's been diverted for public purpose in terms of how the county could benefit from it and how it could reap up i mean how it could use some of the uh, yeah developmental benefits it all falls under the community act of the kenya so it's not very one on one private land negotiation so there weren't any major land conflicts in a more direct sense so to say there were some minor ones during the transmission line because the transmission line route goes through some of the private land. And in one or two cases, there were disagreements and there was a, a demand to divert the route, which, uh, which was done eventually because one or two parcels of the land fell under ancestral land and uh, considered to be sacred. So they were diverted and avoided. Um, I think overall, uh, one of the critical issues was that early on, Rhea and some of the biggest of the chairman of and the CEO of Rhea kept promising a thousand to two thousand jobs. And what it eventually came down to during the entire construction phase, even during the peak of the construction phase, was around three hundred jobs at the maximum. And I think that number hit the, the locals a bit. Uh, in terms of what the expectation what it was and what the reality turned out to be. But overall, there was also a tendency, not just with regard to jobs, but there was a tendency to exaggerate benefits on the part of the area and on the part of the local governments, because that was a way for them to also ensure and minimize resistance and in order to gain that kind of social legitimacy early on so that there are fewer uh, uh, problems and the, the project is... Uh, operated in a smooth way, I mean, constructed. Uh, there were also some uh, minor inconveniences regarding uh, pastoral land, because now that land was diverted. So there was a longer route for some of the pastoralists to access a different land parcel, but the availability of land or accessibility as such was not 
a problem. And there was also a higher expectation for more uh, community development activities. So uh, they had additional demands that were initially uh, that were not considered because of budget uh, restrictions. Thank you very much, Lakshmi. I will bring you in, um, uh, Dr. Hansen, in a moment, um, because I want to give some time, a few minutes, to Ms. Han as well. So you could, uh, any one of you could answer to the, the follow, uh, answer the following question, particularly Dr. Hansen, if you may. Um, what are the impacts of Chinese investment in renewable in renewables on gender and other inequalities? Are the impacts of any are the impacts any different from the non-Chinese invest investments? Yeah, if I can chip in here, yeah, I think that's an extremely good question. Uh, uh, and I think, at least from my perspective, there may be others who, who, who see this differently, but I think it's, 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 uh, it's in a way too early to tell, I would say. We, we have, uh, as we started to, to um, talk about that, we have so, we have relatively limited knowledge at this point about uh, the, what's going on in specific projects in this uh, non-hydropower renewable energy area like solar PV and, and wind power projects. So I have the feeling that research now is very much on a case-by-case -case basis and we're trying to accumulate knowledge of what is actually going on uh, to understand what, what this uh, phenomenon of Chinese involvement in renewable energy in Africa is actually looking like, right? And then the, the logical next step would be to say, okay, once we have a sufficient amount of you know, knowledge, we can go into looking at how does that compare with non-Chinese projects. But of course, one could also, as, as uh, there was a previous presenter who was looking at it from, from this perspective of, of Chinese versus non-Chinese uh, projects from, from Ethiopia, I think that's a very extremely interesting uh, point of view. And um, so, I mean, that's maybe the, the next step, I would say. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry we're running short of time. The question was meant to uh, all the speakers, but I, I, I'll stop there. And now uh, I would like to invite Ms. Han Chen um, to give a, a quick uh, um, wrap up, um, concluding notes on both uh, webinar sessions. Uh, Ms. Um, uh, Han Chen uh, manages N NRDC's uh, work to promote a uh, global energy transition and address climate change at international level. Uh, over to you, uh, Ms. Han. Thanks so much, and thanks to all the presenters from today and from the other session earlier a few weeks ago. I think, you know, just some thoughts trying to draw together both of these different sessions is that, as Dr. Wei mentioned during the first session, there's the high energy potential uh, for renewables in different countries in Africa, which uh, Frankton also mentioned as well in this section, and also high leadership from um, you know, Chinese companies in both solar and wind. But I wanna take a quick step back and look at you know, why are we talking about renewable energy to begin with? And it's because there's this need to deal with the carbon impacts from energy projects and because solar and wind are far less emitting in terms of their full life cycle than other things like coal, oil, and gas. And that's very important because as you can see from the slide, China committed very recently in September, 2020 to reducing and peaking emissions by 2030 and then getting to net neutrality or carbon neutrality by 2060. Now, what does that mean for the Belt and Road? I think it's a very important thing because what it opens up is either a lot of new technology at lower cost for renewables that can be exported or developed in Africa with companies from China. But on the other hand, it also opens up a huge risk because what we could see is that as China moves towards more low carbon energy domestically, companies that have not made that transition in China could end up exporting you know, technologies that are not as useful in China anymore, whether that's coal or gas, et cetera that can be exported more to other countries in Africa and elsewhere. So I, I just wanna to go to the next slide now, um, which shows that you know, even though there is this risk of having a lot of the high carbon infrastructure move out of China, 
as China moves really quickly to get to their um, 2060 goal of being carbon neutral. That's a huge lift. And you know, one of the potentials, the positive possibility is that you have a lot more renewable energy capacity in China that also needs to go overseas. And what I'd like to show here is that the Belt and Road International Green Development Coalition is something that China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment has um, you know, put together with NGOs, including with us at NRDC, international partners, domestic Chinese partners, who are focused on making sure that China's investments will not only you know, drive sustainable development goals overseas, but do so in a way that doesn't cause huge damage to the environment and to water and to air and to health. So if you go to that table that I just showed, um, if you can go back to the one with the different um, boxes, what it shows is that at least in the energy space, they've shown in this traffic light system that's been developed that you know, there are projects that would have huge negative impacts on the ecosystem, on greenhouse gases, pollution, and those are really coal, hydro as well has higher impacts, gas plants, but then at the very bottom, you'll see that you know, solar and wind tend to have the lowest sort of environmental negative impacts of all of these energy types. And that's why I think it's really important today that we're having this conversation about how can solar and wind become a bigger part of the conversation with China going forward. So on the next slide, I won't go into detail, but what it is is just showing that um, outside of Africa and Southeast Asia as one example, when Vietnam in the last two years developed really strong solar and wind policies, they shot up from having almost no, sol no solar and wind to going to one gigawatt and then seven gigawatts of wind, and then from almost no solar to almost eight gigawatts of solar in their plan. And that was because the government locally created policies that were favorable, and then that allowed for a lot of you know, new things to come in. So now turning back to the presentations that were just made today and before, I think some of the challenges that have been identified by a number of colleagues is that there are big limitations on transmission capacity. That's a huge challenge for intermittent power in Africa. Uh, in terms of overcapacity, potentially of having you know, projects that can't have the power evacuated. And then this reliance on traditional energy sources and sort of a conservatism about integrating renewable energy. And then there's questions around whether debt financing with sovereign guarantees is going to be sustainable, which most of the speakers have indicated that it really is not. So another thing identified in the earlier session a few weeks ago was that there's a not really adequate energy think tank cooperation between China and Africa. And so really identifying more practical collaborations in terms of strategic planning, joint research, technology standards for solar and wind, cooperation models, financial tools, and really having a project library of some of these successes and things. And as the speaker earlier from Ethiopia noted, there's already quite a number of off-grid projects that are developed with Chinese involvement, but there's also potential for quite a bit more. So even though we are seeing in places like Zambia, you know, 600 megawatt large projects coming online, we're also seeing this gap in terms of off-grid power potential. And so I think looking at one of the opportunities going forward, it was mentioned in the previous session that to deal with some of these issues around you know, capacity, there's been already a provisional agreement between the National Energy Administration in China and the African Union to launch a China-Africa Energy Cooperation Center in 2021. So to address many of the challenges that have been mentioned, whether on technical capacity, uh, skills, and so on, they're proposing that under the forum, there would be more energy cooperation. There would be a forum every three years. There would be a China-Africa clean energy seminar every year to start talking through some of these issues around technical research and the lack of sort of joint planning. And another thing I identified was this question of you know, local equipment manufacturing. So the infrastructure for developing more of the skills, equipment on the continent rather than having so much of the supply coming from China. And so based on the excellent presentations from you know, the last day and from the previous discussion, 
Some areas of research are obviously on you know, African agency and the role in negotiating projects, which was mentioned several times today. The need to improve the wind and solar policy frameworks of different governments, which was mentioned by Biani and by Frankton. That's a huge challenge because whether it's China or someone else, it's hard for any of these countries to, um, or companies from outside to come in when the risks are so high and that translates into high financing costs for many companies. And then on the Chinese side, one of the big, big issues that was mentioned again today is how can the Chinese companies better integrate the considerations of employment and community development as they're developing policies to go into different countries. And another area for discussion would be, our future research would be really the bidding and procurement process. And will Chinese stakeholders engage more in those types of systems? Are there going to be more bilateral deals or risks of bilateral deals that will cause them to turn to new systems. And then I think both Biani and Halawi mentioned that there's a need to deal with these price fluctuation issues, the lack of confidence in where prices are going. Do we have systems that move from feed-in tariffs to auctions, straight to auctions? I think these are all questions that either in the framework set up for joint cooperation or through you know, seminars like this, it can be discussed what's the right frameworks for different countries and different um, setups. And then finally, uh, I think as the case study from Kenya showed, there really does need to be more in-depth research on specific cases to highlight the, the challenges and opportunities moving forward. So I appreciate the opportunity to um, participate in this discussions. And I think, you know, I guess final note would be that there's a lot of cooperation potential with Chinese NGOs and with a lot of international organizations in China, including the civil society side and energy think tank side for enhanced cooperation with African uh, think tanks and NGOs to um, accelerate the renewable energy potential. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ms. Mahan Chen. And um, you've made an excellent summary. I have nothing to add except to thank all uh, the panelists and and yourself for the time and the contribution to this debate. Uh, I would also like to thank participants for joining the call and um, putting forward the useful uh, questions. Uh, obviously, as you noted, these two sessions um, are just the beginning. So we will aim to have more sessions on similar topics and we will keep um, participants informed about um, our upcoming events. Uh, for now, um, I declare this session closed and bye.